A quick shout out to our sponsor and podcast home app, Anchor FM. Do you want to start a podcast? As your host of coaching you through all things education and the founder of ANC Unlimited, I use Anchor FM for easy editing, connecting with other podcast apps such as Spotify, Apple, and of course now iHeartRadio. It's free, so I can create as many episodes or bonus episodes for my listeners as I choose. Sign up today at anchor.fm. Connection, engagement, rigor, success. Here on Coaching You Through All Things Education Podcast, we are building a legacy of success together, one episode at a time, each Tuesday at noon. As your host, Anne Labangana Clay of ANC Unlimited, we will unpack relevant topics in education together. And when I'm not podcasting, coaching, or consulting, stop by our website, acunlimited.org, for our new blog, Coaching You EDU, and a menu of services. If something resonates with you during this episode, message me on the podcast app of your choice or leave a comment on LinkedIn, our company Facebook page, or on Twitter. Our guests appreciate your feedback. Check out the story notes for our social media details. And certainly, if you have an episode suggestion, send it to coachingallthingsedu at gmail.com. Now let's dive in. Hello, and welcome to episode number 30 of Coaching You Through All Things Education podcast. I am so tickled pink today to have Dr. Dana Goodyear with us today. Dr. Goodyear has 21 years of experience in education where she has taught world languages and English and worked as a middle school administrator. She completed her doctorate degree in educational leadership in the early 2020. For her dissertation, she researched reasons parents were opting their students out of high stakes testing at middle schools and how that has affected the district accreditation ratings. She often speaks at conferences, providing educators with techniques to minimize off-task behavior and to increase time on task. She is a fellow podcast host of Out of the Trenches podcast, which features educators who share their stories of resiliency. Welcome, Dana. Well, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be a guest on your podcast this time. Oh, yes, indeed. I very much enjoyed the opportunity to be able to be on your podcast uh, most recently and and appreciate all the work that you do. We're going to start with question number one. In one of your recent teachbetter.com blogs, you discuss your thoughts on the future of education post-pandemic. You pose the elephant in the room question of what are things we'd like to put in the past from the pre-pandemic educational model? Can you share some of your findings through your interviews and your research? Well, things that I think should be put in the past are um, just using a lot of uh, tech tools that weren't Um, necessarily effective in teaching, right? There were a lot of people Mm -hmm. who tried out tech tools. Um, Maybe there were tech tools that came with a curriculum or uh, tools that really didn't engage students um, 
very much uh, that they were kind of half-heartedly using, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of people tried out things when the pandemic hit because were, everything was free last mm -hmm. spring. So mm -hmm. I think um, over the course of the fall and now into the spring of 21, a lot of educators have gotten used to something that they like, it, whether they're still teaching fully remote in some kind of hybrid or fully in person. And I think um, going uh, by the wayside of not using any tech tools is something definitely we're not going to be doing. Uh, I think there were a lot of uh, teachers that maybe veered away from using tech tools. Um, maybe people who'd been in the classroom since the 80s, <laughs> right? Um, and, and they were afraid to use tech tools, right? So I think those people have found something through um, colleagues or through trainings that they've been able to use. But I think uh, tech tools that aren't effective, um, that are sometimes, um, you know, sometimes I've used things when I taught foreign languages that often were part of the curriculum that weren't really fully embedded into my teaching. And I think those kind of half-hearted tech tools didn't really serve uh, its purpose too well. Um, but I also think um, something that we are going to move away from is the um, inability to um, contact parents, right? Because um, a lot of the time as an administrator and as a teacher, I didn't have like the correct phone number for parents um, or, you know, they kept moving or, you know, you send emails and they bounced back. So I think a lot of what we've experienced over the course of the pandemic is the um, just uh, being more open and, and the parents are being a lot more communicative with us. They want oh, to know what's going on with their students, um, even at the high school level. So I think schools have been able to uh, reach out to them easier. And also something that I, I would say I veered away from um, often was making the home visits. And that's something that happened in the fall. Um, I, I wouldn't say a lot, but it did happen occasionally because there were students who weren't showing up to the online lessons. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, when I started out as a dean of students is when I started doing home visits because of attendance. But in the pandemic era, when everything was remote and people weren't showing up to classes, you kind of have to, you know, you bring somebody with you from the building and you make those home visits because you want to check in. And I know a lot of people did that um, in the spring, right? Because they... Mm -hmm delivered materials if people sure. didn't have internet access um, and, and sometimes, you know, cards and things like that, right? But I think just, I think there's been, prior to the pandemic, there was that, um, maybe that fear of kind of, you know, stepping mm. on people's toes, right? If, yeah, you, if you made that home visit, right? And I think, um, you know, you can try to get a hold of them and, and, you know, say you're coming at a specific time, leave a message, but sometimes you're not able to get hold of them. And um, you find out a lot, right? If, if oh, maybe definitely. a student has several younger siblings they're watching or mm -hmm. kind of the living environment and that, that provides you with empathy and uh, just see, seeing into that child's life and you know, providing them with extra resources that they may need. So I think mm -hmm. definitely that, I think that bridge has um, uh, been kind of connected better um, the, mostly the family and um, educator um, bridge mm -hmm. that we kind of had, we kind of had, at least at the secondary level, um, a, a lot of like uh, bumps in the road, I think, in getting communication with parents. And I think that's, that's mm -hmm. opened up over the course of the pandemic. Mm, you brought up some excellent points about how we need to reevaluate, right? The mm -hmm. tools that we've been provided some of them have been free tools and yeah. some of them have been, you know, district have purchased uh, platforms and things that they hadn't in the past, but um, we need to take a look at them, right? See, are yeah. they really adding value? And you made a really good point um, about, does it add value for the staff member, right? Whether they mm -hmm. be veteran or somebody who just came out of college and knows all the tech, um, you know, and is it valuable or has it been valuable? And it sounds like you gave some excellent examples that we know for ourselves as well, where parents have been able to connect with the, with the school, with the educator, mm -hmm. um, you know, through means that we haven't been able to before. And sometimes it's just that quick Zoom, right? They, mm -hmm. <laughs> that quick mm -hmm. moment that they're able to tap in, I mean, touch base with the teacher via Zoom. But um, but either way, that has been a real plus, I think. Mm -hmm. um, that we 
Yeah, and I think there are a lot of parents, because my experience is mostly at the secondary level, um, you know, they, they would get a call from the school and they would be worried, you know, what has my child done, right? Yeah. And it would be something negative. Mm -hmm. And I think now mm -hmm. we're bridging that gap of, you know, we just want to reach out. We just want to find out what's going on. If the, if the child's learning from home, right, uh, that they feel like we're more on the same team with them than we're like, you know, trying to find fault. Because that's kind of, as a, as a parent, they see that like, oh, the schools, you know, have something negative to say, right? If, if the child is in school, right? But, you know, we've, we've had to have those parents on the same team as us when the child's been learning from home this year. Which has been fantastic, right? <laughs> fantastic. All right. Our next question. In another recent a blog post in teachbetter.com, you unpack your passion for empowering teachers to take on leadership roles. What are two to three takeaways you'd like leaders to remember? Well, one of the takeaways I think is just seeing um, a potential in your teachers, right? Um, a lot of teachers um, have personalities where they might be able to reach out to their assistant principal or principal and say, hey, I'd like to lead a committee. Mm -hmm. However, there are some teachers who may be newer to the building or um, you know, they, they just don't know their place yet in the building and they don't know who to talk to about that. So yeah. I, think, I think a good idea is providing those opportunities. There was a school I started at in 2013 and I remember um, when they have the staff development days at the beginning of the year, they have like a list of these are committees we need people on, here are the contact people. And as somebody who wanted to develop, to develop my leadership potential, that was a big plus because I was able to see, hey, okay, I contact this person if I want to be on this committee. You know, they, they said they had a document, like we need help with X, Y, and Z. Ooh, yes. Yeah. So I think that helps a lot. But also, um, something I talk about in that blog article is um, uh, walkthroughs. So um, as a teacher team, um, to have those walkthrough opportunities, and this can be done during um, a department's planning period, um, or if you, if you teach at elementary school, it can be done during a grade level planning period, or even a, during a professional day. You don't have to do walkthroughs necessarily with kids in the classroom. No. Um, I've been a part of a walkthrough where it was a professional day and uh, we discussed, because um, it was an English department, we were discussing um, walkthroughs in a math department. Oh. So, you know, and I mean, obviously you're not teaching the same thing, but you want to look for certain things. So it could be connected to the school's um, unified improvement plan. Like, are we looking for visuals of, you know, questioning strategies, right? Are we looking for visuals of, um, you know, student work being displayed or um, guiding questions, those type of things. So, you know, have that pre um, walkthrough um, session, right? It could be yeah. half an hour to an hour and then um, find out what you're gonna look for in that teacher's classroom um, and then ask questions. And, and I remember that walkthrough that I did with the English department, you know, we were free to take pictures and, oh. you know, free to post those out on the school social media, right? Yeah, and, you know, and then you can see like, hey, um, you know, I really enjoyed seeing what X, Y, and Z teacher is doing in their classroom. Uh, because then, you know, as a part of a teacher team, you don't really get an opportunity to see other teachers' classrooms unless you're covering for them if there's like right. emergency sub coverage. And, and if you're covering for them, you're not really pre occupied with looking at their classroom you're preoccupied with getting the kids to do work right so, <laughs> so so actually you know having the opportunity either during a professional day or during your planning period and you know maybe going in there when there are kids in there and having like those look fors mm -hmm. I think it's a great opportunity to um be able to just get some professional development in your building through colleagues right because mm -hmm. I think that's so valuable is learning from other people you work with that you don't necessarily deal with on a regular basis if they teach a different subject than you. Right, right. And again, you know, you were saying that secondary, but it absolutely could apply to, um, you know, elementary mm -hmm. as well. You know, you, you coming from the, we call it ELA, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but the English background and going into a different content such as math, mm -hmm. which is what completely different, right? I mean, mm -hmm. night and day as far as content, 
but the teaching strategies or the visuals or you know those types of things are impactful and can mm-hmm, change mm-hmm. your right to change the way that you teach um or or present present your content that's awesome mm-hmm. i mean i think we yeah. don't dive deep enough into the talent that we have right mm-hmm. within our own grass like we don't always have to go outside which we do yeah <laughs> because we need to have a, a great speaker etc but you know sometimes we need to like you said on those uh department uh chair meetings or team meeting times or even a professional day to uh take time and 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 glean from from the talent that's inside of our own buildings that's Mm -hmm. awesome yeah and then you get those ideas that you can use in your classroom and sometimes Mm -hmm. you have a student who might say oh miss so-and-so uses that oh well i got that idea from visiting her classroom (laughs) right (laughs) yes and i think it's a it's a it's a culture right that's developed within a in a school community Mm-hmm. where that willingness to share to be vulnerable right I mean mm-hmm. you know, even though you're showcasing something you know there's always the potential you know that somebody might find um some a critique be able to critique it but that's mm-hmm. not the point you know the point is um you know to to open the doors to to uh everyone's eyes so they can see what's going on that's good right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's really cool yeah It's professional uh, learning under your own roof. Love it. Love it. Sounds free too. Yeah. (laughs) I think I think school districts are knocking on your door for more ideas. (laughs) Oh, that's great. All right, let's see our question number three. I am intrigued. I know I always tell you this, but I am intrigued by your podcast title out of the trenches can you unpack for our listening audience the meaning behind the title and the impact you continue to have on your listeners well you know i started my podcast in may i think mid-may of 2020 and obviously everybody is kind of in the trenches at that point right Try, just trying to end the school year and you know, the weirdest um, nine weeks that they'd experienced, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, but it wasn't necessarily just tied to the pandemic. I think it was a great time to launch. Mm-hmm. But also I was thinking, you know, there's been a time where most educators have been in the trenches at some point, right? They, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, a lot of people I've interviewed have, you know, a, a story from recently that they've been in the trenches, you know, some superintendents, for example, mm-hmm. that, um, you know, in the fall when they were going back and forth in person, and hybrid and remote, right? And then figuring out also the safety protocols. That was a trench story for a couple people. Um, but also people I've taught to have had trench stories from um, the first year of teaching. That's come up, up a lot, right? Exactly. Where people yeah. talk about like, you know, maybe they got laid off after their first year because there were budget cuts and, and how do they dig themselves out of that trench, right? And uh, okay. people's trench stories could be um, having to do with the student that they worked with, right? And then the impact that they had on that student's life. So everybody um, has a different, um, take on the trench story. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, um, you know, I kind of had that visual in my head. I I thought about launching a podcast about nine months prior to, to May, but I was finishing up my doctorate and I, you know, I didn't want to like put all the effort into putting together a podcast. And, you know, once at the end of the year was wrapping up, you know, I, I launched and, you know, it's been great. And I've had a lot of guests on and I just uh, published episode 63. So, you know, I'm on a roll. (laughs) Congratulations. Thank you. So, you know, and I think that's a great question. I always lead off with tell me about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out, right? And, you know, and, and, everybody has something to share about that but then the impact that it has on listeners is that story of resilience right because you know everybody learns like I've had stories of like just being in the trenches and and learning from resilience prior to the pandemic and that helped me kind of get through that period of like having everything shut down and having my kids learning from home and those type of things and I think the more resilient we are the easier you know we're we're able to handle things that are difficult Indeed. yeah so um you know and i and, and i always listen to podcasts prior to launching mine i had been a fan of several different podcasts and you know i kind of um 
had you know in mind some questions I could ask people like like some of those hosts of those podcasts that I listen to so you know I kind of knew the format to, to go with and um, you know it's 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 been really enjoyable getting to know the guests that I have on and, and continue to interview. I am sure it is. <laughs> well for the listeners you know they definitely if you if you have not heard out of the trenches you need to go to your nearest um you can actually go to um <laughs> our story notes right we'll have it her website and uh, you could follow her on twitter she's always posting uh the actual links to those podcast episodes which is fantastic oh thanks for sharing that all right let's see you are, you and I are one of 100 guest authors <clears throat> for Dr. Rick Jetter's compilation entitled 100 No Nonsense Things That All Teachers Should Stop Doing. I'm chapter 56 and you are chapter 25, using children to further adult agendas, meaning stop doing that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why did you pick that topic? And please provide us with one takeaway, if you could. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it kind of tied into what I had studied for my doctorate, right? Um, okay. So when we, when, when we think of adult agendas, uh, we often think of testing. And, um, you know, and that's a big topic right now in the spring, right? In Colorado, we are doing standardized testing and we're, we're uh, shaving down the requirements a little bit, but um, my kids are currently getting tested this week, right? And um, in a way, you know, I, in, in the chapter, I talk a little bit about being, um, you know, part of proctoring the exam ever since I've taught in Colorado okay. in 2002, right? And I was, um, up to about 2015, I was an electives teacher. So my, what I taught wasn't tested on, right? Uh, isn't that something? Okay. Got yeah. It. And so, you know, it, like what I, you know, I didn't teach to the test or prepare kids oh, no. for the test that everybody, like the school weight puts so much emphasis on, right? Mm -hmm. But then, you know, as part of the staff, you're, you're expected to, you know, proctor the test, you know, and there's, you know, those rigid rules of, you know, how, how much you could say to the kids, like, you know, those type of things, but, you know, and, and, and then the school, you know, is um, very keen on, you know, how much participation they get. Right. And so when I did my doctorate research, I, I wanted to see how that affected a district's accreditation rating. If it was, um, you know, if they were um, accredited low participation, that means they were lower participation than 95%. Okay. So, um, you know, and then how I looked at, I narrowed it down to a couple of middle schools in the district, but oh, I talked about going um, one middle school that went from first, uh, they went from seventh place in the district. Uh, there were seven middle schools. So they went from seventh mm. place to first place mm. in, in terms of their participation rate. But wow, the, the school, yeah, but the school didn't like throw its incentives at parents and students, right? Okay, they okay. just, they provided information as to how the school was using the data from testing. Ah, yeah, and that was up to, yeah. Power, right? Yeah, so, you know, and that, you know, I kind of looked at like, parents that were opting out their kids prior to that and why the parents might have not opted out their kids in 2018 and 19. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of what I talk about in that chapter is uh, just kind of my experience um, having been a part of um, schools and staff that had um, done, you know, high stakes testing ever since NCLB, right? <laughs> <Do you remember? laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know and then we had race to the top right we right that oh, and, yes. oh, and, and yes. kind of how these things have affected our um just mentality and you know like I remember what was it around 14 15 when they were talking about you know connecting the uh kids um how they scored on the high stakes test to the teacher evaluation and okay. you know that didn't affect me at the time because I, I wasn't teaching a subject that was tested on mm. but you know there was so much controversy around like you know because like this is a snapshot of a day right oh, so definitely. you know it's a right. day that they're testing and you know they might show up they might not and they you know they'll half-heartedly do it so uh, you know I think um everything is kind of 
you know, it's tied into that, like, you know, governmental agency requirement, mm -hmm. even though it's at the state level, like, mm -hmm. and how can we maybe change it? How can we move away from that in, mm -hmm. um, you know, 21 to 25, I would say, because it's going to take a while, right? It's going I to, it yeah, it's not going to be something that happens overnight, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but like, we, we do need to get some data from kids. I, I do agree yes. that like after not testing in 2020, like I told my middle schooler, you know, you should take this because we want to know if you're, you're lacking any skills, right? Because he has an IEP as well. So it's good for us to know, even though when he took the test in 19 and before that, it didn't really reflect his knowledge because, mm -hmm. it, you know, he didn't score that high. And I think it was just because he just doesn't do well in those type of tests. And that's common with a lot of kids. Oh, right? absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And I didn't do very well. The few tests that we took when we were growing up, right? Maybe it was every two or three years. It wasn't nearly as much right. as that. I was going to but... say, it was, no, it was not as frequent <laughs> as it is. Now. Yeah. But That's I remember true. I didn't score too high on those no, type of tests I either. I mean, I score, everybody did okay, but you know, right, we didn't score as high as yeah. you know, was expected. And so, you know, that opens up a huge conversation. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we <laughs> addressed a little bit of that on my, uh, when I was with you before, you know, what is the true value? Like you said, there is value mm -hmm. in, you know, what gaps are you missing? You know, yeah, what things yeah. do you still need to work on? Absolutely. Assessments, you know, of some type are important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having an assessment, a standardized assessment that addresses, you know, um, everybody gets the same assessment. I think there's value in that as well. Mm -hmm. However, um, I completely agree with you that it's it's worthy of many discussions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think the pandemic has opened up that door for us where we can have those conversations um, from the top down, from the bottom up, you know, about it and the, and the true value because there, there are students that are stressed out mm -hmm. most years, right? Yeah. Over standardized tests. And, you know, where is it taking you? And I, I don't want to go off tangent, but there's this great... Um, Netflix uh, that's out now about the college at the college level, right? Mm -hmm. About unfortunately the whole, <laughs> you know, a little a little scandal about getting into college. But part of that Netflix series w talked about, you know, how valuable are the SATs? Why were the mm -hmm, SATs mm -hmm. created and and things of that nature? And so I'm sure that's going to be part of your future research, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. right? Because it's because um, there's so much. But but I'm glad you brought that up. I, it's definitely time for us to talk about it mm -hmm. uh, very seriously and see what we can do that's best for kids. That's the bottom line. What the data needs to reflect what's best for kids and what mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. we're going to move them and not um, you know dollar signs or anything else. So. Yeah, yeah. And I think that part when you talk about the SAT, like, you know, I, I remember testing and, and taking it a couple times before um, I went to college, but like, I didn't get that high of score. And I mean, one is that, you know, you're not a great test taker, but also like, I mean, I'm strong in English, but like not very strong in math, right? So I mean, both for SATs, right? Yeah. And then, then I had to take the GRE, Right. And, uh, and, and, I, and they were testing me in math again. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to major. in. I mean, I didn't major in anything math related during my undergraduate. Why should I have a graduate entry level test mm. with math? Mm. <laughs> what is the value? That is our big yeah. question. Yeah, that's the thing. Right? <laughs> wow. Wow. No, I get it. We've all been there, unfortunately. So. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, thank you for unpacking that a little bit. We're we're looking forward to that to that book coming out mm -hmm. soon. Yeah, it should spring. be out soon. Mm -hmm. It should be. All right. This last question is trending on the show and is one of my favorite. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what legacy message would you print on it and why? So what I would say is don't hold back. Go for those things you want to pursue in order to accomplish greater things. Oh, yes. <laughs> now that's a billboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, what, what kind of stuck out, you know, when, I, when I'm thinking about that, I was watching um, Sunday morning yesterday, um, you know, on, I think it's on CBS, and um, they were talking about Tammy Duckworth. 
Oh, and I, I mean, I, I have, you know, I'm proud of some of my accomplishments with my doctorate and, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've accomplished in my career and, yeah. and things, but, you know, Tammy, like she, she's wounded, you know, she, she's amputated. She ended up getting her doctorate after she came back. Um, you know, she, she has a couple of kids that she had later on in life, you know, I mean, she went for everything that she wanted, you know, and then she became a Senator. Right. And so like somebody like, like that is just a real go-getter. And I think anybody you know, I, Brandon Beck, for example, who I've had on the podcast, you know, he has that hashtag uh, unlocking and limited potential, Ooh. you know, I mean, everybody okay. has some type of potential, right? And and some people just need to discover what their potential is. That's it. But I think, you know, you don't need to hold back. Um, you can pursue your, your dreams. For me, my doctorate was, um, you know, I'd, I'd started a program back in early 2000s and I uh, didn't complete that. And then back in 2016, you know, I just started a doctorate program in something else, right? And it was all online. So it was easier to do than going to classes in person. But, yes. you know, I think if you have a desire to accomplish something, you know, and you can't say, oh, well, next year will be a better time, right? Ooh. Like if you want to launch a podcast, you know, just go for it, right? Yes. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> As we know, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know what? and I think you make an excellent point, whether it be a doctoral program or a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's that first leap, right? You yeah. have to take that first leap and you'll find out once you do it, right? Mm -hmm. Once you take mm -hmm. the leap, that it's easier than you answer. And the fear sometimes, yeah. Yeah. you know, sometimes gets in the way. And you have been an amazing example of being fearless, right? <laughs> After Thank you, you. Made your leap with your doctorate as well as with your podcast and all of your accomplishments. We really enjoy reading your blogs and, and other uh, things on social media. So you can continue to give us wisdom and to help us see different perspectives that you know change our thinking in education. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Well, I love being part of a community that, you know, inspires people and where, you know, you can learn from each other, like on Twitter, right? And, and everybody has something to, um, to contribute, right? And we're all kind of connected together that way um, on social media. And, you know, we all work in different spaces, but we're, we're learning. That's our, kind of an own, my own professional learning community, right? That's right. Oh, definitely. <laughs> the P the PLN, I guess is yes. a professional learning network. But yes, it is a, it is a professional learning community. And so many times, you know, like you said, you you want to expand your horizons. What are they doing mm -hmm. in Colorado? You know what I mean? What are they doing mm -hmm. in other places? Um, you know, that are great and I can use right back in my building, back in my mm -hmm. district. So mm -hmm. uh, you make an excellent point. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We absolutely loved having you, Dana. Well, thanks so much for having me on. <laughs> All right. You're welcome. And have an awesome rest of the day. You too. Thanks. Well, that concludes another episode of Coaching You Through All Things Education. As Confucius states, those people who develop the ability to continuously acquire new and better forms of knowledge that they can apply to their work and into their lives will be the movers and shakers in our society for the indefinite future. Again, you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter, or you can also find us on our Facebook page, A and C Unlimited. As a reminder, for a free consultation in any area of education that you choose, for educators, administrators, or parents, please visit acunlimited.org. Until next time, stay stress-free and be well.